you know, about a month and a half ago, I started making some apple cider for myself. Oh. Beautiful, clear, I mean crystal clear, fantastic apple cider. Watch this video. You're going to find out how to make this delicious, tasty cider. It's worth your time. It really is. And it's not hard. Good stuff. Mm. All righty. Well, howdy, folks. Pardon me for just a moment. I'm busy putting up some grain here. I've got some, uh, uh, God, that smells good. That's some roasted barley, all right? And uh, I've got a six row barley right here. That's something I make beer out of, okay? I was talking about these items on a video that I did right before this one. And it um, was on basically just fermenting, home fermenting gets into a little bit of, you know, is it legal, what are the laws, that kind of thing. And uh, just an overview of what fermenting is about and what making alcohol at home is about. Today, this video, this is about making apple cider. And this is Texas Cooking Today, by the way. I'm Stuart. This is my kitchen. You're welcome here anytime. Thank you for watching. Today, we're making cider and folks, it is so easy. You put apple juice and yeast together. You give it the right conditions. And in a couple of weeks, you've got a beautiful fermented beverage that is delicious. Now I love, absolutely love making cider. Cider is probably one of the easiest things that you can make when it comes to home brewing. Uh, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, it is the lowest cost and easiest item to make. And it's also one of the most delicious. All right, so all I'm gonna be doing is placing my cider into this carboy. We're gonna add yeast, stir it together, put the fermentation lock, this guy right up here on top, and we're gonna get this started. Now I'm gonna be filming this over a period of weeks. So you're gonna see my clothes change, you're gonna see, things moved around in different places. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like when the fermentation's happening. You might think, oh, you can't see fermenting. Well, yeah, you can. And <laughs> it is very apparent. And there's a lot of activity that goes on in a fermenter and it's kind of interesting to watch. So I'm gonna let you see that. I'm gonna let you see the whole process beginning to end. I'm gonna turn this into a sparkling cider so it's nice and fizzy and just absolutely delicious. Something good for Christmas. Um, two things you need to know. Number one, your yeast. This isn't something where you go to the supermarket and purchase what's called brewer's yeast. That's stuff that they put in bread to make breads taste like the yeast that's used for brewing, okay? It doesn't mean it's the same yeast, folks. You need to get some brewing yeast. And there's a lot, of, if you don't have a, a brewing supply in the town that you live in, there are a lot of brewing supply companies online that sell all of these products, all right? And it's easy to get. Legality is you're allowed to brew up to 250 gallons per household in the United States. That's federal law. Now check with your state. Your state may have some additional laws that curb that or uh, give you different rights, okay? So double check that. Now in the state of Texas, we go by the federal law. The federal law allows us to make beer, wine, cider, sake, anything that's fermented, but distillation still requires a license. Okay, so you can't do that at home. Probably for the best, stills can explode and it's not pretty when they do. All right, now, come on over. Let's take a look at what we got here and we're gonna get started on this. Oh, I would like to mention that though I am not sponsored, I do have an affiliate agreement with two different companies. One of them that provides chef's thermometers. It's an item that, trust me, every kitchen needs one of these. All kinds of things that can be improved by you using a good quality thermometer. This one has a display that changes, moves around on it, 
and it has a lot of really good features. So definitely take a look at Chef's Temp. The link is right down below in the description box. And also you'll see a link there for wild grain. Those are breads, sourdough breads, pastas and pastries that come mail order and you put them in the freezer when you're ready to cook them up, pop them in the oven. 20 minutes after, at 450 degrees, 20 minutes later, you've got beautiful steaming sourdough bread. <laughs> Doesn't get better. <laughs> Fresh baked without the work. Okay, take a look at that. Come on over. So my apple juice. What is important about your apple juice? Doesn't matter what brand you're using or whether it's organic or not or whatever. You just want to read the label. You want to make sure that number one, there's no added sugars. You don't want high fructose corn syrup or corn syrup or dextrose or anything added. This says filtered water, apple juice, concentrate, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. That's it, okay? That's all that's in it. Just apple juice, water, and a little vitamin C added to it, that, that citric acid. And that's actually a good thing. It gives a, a better flavor to a sparkling cider. You get a little bit acidic and it's wonderful. Okay, so perfect item right here. And what's neat is I look for the lowest cost. A basic label with no um, preservatives at the lowest cost. Now you can say, look, ascorbic acid isn't a preservative. Yes, it is, but it's not one that'll kill yeast. The rest of them will. If you get something that's got potassium metabisulfide or something like that in it, then you're going to have a, a liquid that the yeast will die in. It will not be able to live in that. So you need something that's just very basic. Look at those labels. Next thing, on the yeast for this, I'm going to recommend that you purchase this right here. It's called Nottingham Yeast. It's put out by uh, uh, Lallymund and excellent yeast for this. This is a, an ale yeast that's designed to produce like British ales and stuff. But when it comes to making cider, it's been the best yeast I've ever found for this purpose. All right, so got this right here and it'll take one package of this yeast to the full five gallon batch. All right, now I need to get this stuff into my carboy and get it started. And that means break out the funnel, which is this guy right here. We're gonna fill this carboy up and then we're gonna get busy brewing. Now, something I'll mention to you. If you're gonna brew, the first thing you have to remember is sanitize, sanitize everything. This has to be sanitized. This has to be sanitized. Everything we use needs to be sanitized. Now, I've already ran this stuff through bleach yesterday, so it's had a good hardcore cleaning. And then I did a lot of rinsing to make sure there was no residual bleach. You have to be able to put your nose up in here in the opening of this bottle and smell no bleach. And if you smell no bleach at all, then you're ready to brew. If you have an odor of bleach at all, that will be just enough to kill your yeast or at least to slow down the fermentation and mess with it. Okay, so rinse it a couple extra times if you do smell any. Okay, so I've got my fermenter here. I have a nice clean fermentation lock here. Now what a fermentation lock is, folks, this is something that keeps air from getting in there but allows the bubbles of carbon dioxide to come out. All right, and there will be a lot of it coming out. So what happens is I fill this outer container right here with water up to this line right here. It's kind of hard to see for y'all. Um, and then I place this which is sort of just a cover that's got slots in the bottom down here. It fits over a tube that rises from the center all the way up. So what happens is carbon dioxide will come up that tube and then it gets forced down through the water and it bubbles out. And that keeps that water is a fermentation lock that keeps air from coming up into the system. So these things are quite important and they do a really cool job. Uh, they're also kind of fun when you get down to it and you see what happens. So, right up here, we're going to start filling this thing up. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll say this. When you're putting a funnel into a bottle like this and pouring large amounts of liquid through that funnel, the pressure in the bottle is going to increase. The air that's in the bottle needs to go somewhere. It's going to push its way out. 
do not force your funnel down into the neck. It will pop the funnel out as you're pouring liquid in if you do. This funnel has little ribs on the outside of it that allow it to only go so far down into the bottle and that allows air to vent out around this. So these kinds of items, this funnel, this bottle, all of this stuff, you're gonna find this available at any brew shop that you buy from. They all sell the same equipment, folks. Might be a variation of this, a different color or whatever, but it still does the same job the same way. Okay, now we are down to the last bottle. The last bottle right here, and I've got my yeast right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start rehydrating my yeast a little bit. Let me cut this little guy open. All right. Mm, smells good. Now, first thing I wanna do, without making too much of a mess, hopefully, a little bit of apple juice here. I'm gonna pour my yeast right in it. There we go. And what I'm doing here is I'm just getting it uh, to mix with the liquid, nothing more. I could pour it directly into the carboy, but for some folks, that's kind of difficult sometimes. So, in this case, I just pre-mix it right here. And then I can pour this into my funnel and chase it with the rest of this um, apple juice here. Now I'm getting the full aroma from that yeast and it is absolutely incredible. It's a beautiful aroma. Um, I like the smell of yeast. Some people are not too partial to it, but I think it's nice myself. All right, so there we go. Now, whenever we pour yeast into something that we're fermenting, we call that inoculating. Okay, don't ask me why they use that terminology. I didn't come up with it, folks, but. That's what's the, the term that's commonly used in beer making or in wine making. We're going to inoculate with the um, yeast. There we go. That got it. Now, the rest of this will wash out my funnel. Any extra yeast that might be in there. All right, so we have all of our apple juice down in our carboy. Now, I wanna say this. In the world of brewing and supplies and things like that, they don't make anything that is really good that I know of to stir carboys with, all right? What I have found is this is a stirring paddle. This is what's commonly used for stirring the mash and things like that for making beer. The problem is, is it doesn't quite fit through the top. But the other end that has a little tab, well, guess what, folks? It goes right in there. Just give it a good stir. And again, you might say, oh, you're getting air in it. Yeah, initially, at the beginning, before the ferment starts, we do want to aerate just slightly. And that adds what the yeast will need. Now this also gets the yeast thoroughly combined in that liquid. All right, looky there. So it is all stirred. Cool. Next, we need the fermentation lock on top. I need to fill it. I can fill it with water or I can fill it with vodka or anything I want. I like to use vodka in my fermentation locks. And that is for good reason, folks. If this were to get sucked into the, uh, into the fermenter, it's not gonna do any damage. It's alcohol, okay? And it is nice, clean, safe, sanitary alcohol. So I can put this in there, right? No, I need to wet my bung. If I wet this little rubber bung 
this little cork here, then it's going to help it to grab a hold of that glass way better. All right, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. What am I going to wet it with? Well, the same stuff I put inside of it, of course. It doesn't take much, but good way to do it right there. Now, I squeeze that down in the top. Don't push it in too tight. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready right here to get started making cider. From here, it's the yeast that has to do the thing. All right, and I want to show you that process as it happens. Um, this is going to get set aside, and it won't be until probably tomorrow that I see activity. But if it happens later today, I'll show it then. All right, there it is, folks. <laughs> That's all there is to how to make cider. All right, folks, there you see a fermentation lock that is actually doing its job. It's giving off its carbon dioxide there. Right down here in my fermenter, the whole tank is quite active right now. We're gonna zoom in up here. There we go. My apologies for a little rough camera work there. So we can see the top of that tank, that crescent, and the business and how busy it is. You can see the small bubbles coming around the edges on that. You see all the activity on top of it. So my apple cider is up and running. This is 16 hours later, and it is in a full ferment right now. Um, there we go. got kind of a flat sound to it which happens once the full fermenting gets kicked up and then that will clear up as the liquid gets dark so we're just waiting for all of that to happen this goes through uh, a lot of change at the very beginning this is what fermenting looks like when it starts okay let's take a look at our cider this is day number two okay now I cover these carboys to keep them protected from light. All right, and as we see up here on my fermentation lock, it's just bubbling away. And that's because down here, we are releasing all kinds of gases from this thing. Let me look inside my tank here. Yeah, I mean, all these bubbles popping and surfacing up here, all that is is just lots of that carbon dioxide rising up. And you can see it in the bottle. It's just fizzing, essentially. Let's look up a little bit closer here. There we are. Mm -hmm. So you can see right on the surface there, we have the bubbling and carrying on. A lot of activity down in this. And of course, if you also, once again, if you look closely, you can see even swirling on the surface of it. There's a great deal of movement in any one of these fermenters. The activity is extreme and there is, um, there's more life to it than people really realize unless they've actually fermented. If you've done this, you've seen this before. But if not, this might all be new to you. So there's what it looks like day two and we're still up and making alcohol, folks. Our yeast is working for us. Okay, let's take a look at these fermentations. Oh, now I've had these running for a few days now. Um, both of these fermentations, this one's the cider. It's been running since the fifth. This is the ninth. Uh, you can see up here where we had some of the foam in here kind of rise up on the side. Now it gets washed back down. And that's kind of normal. I'm still seeing bubbles rising up in this. Uh, and we're still getting, of course, bubbling on top up there. So there's a lot of activity in there. When you look up close with this, you can see a lot of movement, some swirling of the uh, contents inside. And the same thing over here. I see a lot of activity and movement. In the bottom of both of these, we get a nice yeast cake buildup. Folks, the yeast from brewing can actually be saved and reused. So that's one of the little things that you have the opportunity to save money on if you want to get into this kind of hobby. You don't have to buy yeast every time. 
you can reuse it the same way you do like a yeast starter for bread. Okay, so white Zinfandel up and running for four days and still just bubbling away. And the apple cider here up and running for four days and it's still fermenting also. These generally take a week, uh, sometimes two weeks in the primary ferment stage, which is what we're in now. We'll know that this stage is over with when this light color goes away and it turns dark. That means it's turning clear. And that's when it's time to move it to another fermenter. Until then, we get to wait. Well, we have been through a lot of fermenting. Today is racking day. The cider, looking good. So you'll know, we started this on the 5th. Today is the 15th, so it's been in there for 10 days. And if you're wondering about that background noise, oh, that's just the dishwasher. Don't worry about it. Uh, I'm gonna uncover these so you can take a look. I've got my wine here, my cider here. I just kinda want you to compare and uh, know what all's going on. Now the wine has to be in the primary fermenter a little bit longer. It takes longer to ferment. There's a lot of sugar there. And then uh, the cider, generally it is done fermenting in six or seven days. It's set here a little longer than usual. It won't hurt a thing if that happens. Uh, it'll be fine. Let's take a look at them. There we go. So as you can see, we have two very different looking creatures here. This is a white Zinfandel. This one over here is our cider. Now the cider I'm going to be racking today. Now what does that mean, racking? Racking is a term used in brewing that refers to transferring the liquid from one fermenter to another location sometimes another fermenter, sometimes a location that I can dispense from. For me, I use what's called a dispensing bucket. It's a large bucket that's food grade that has a spigot at the bottom that allows me to easily dispense into bottles. That's the way I do it. So, we aren't there yet. We are at the point of transferring it to a new fermenter. So I need a secondary fermenter. Now, if you'll notice, on the bottom here, there is this layer. It looks like sand, okay, and that is a layer of yeast, okay, that has uh, cooked off and settled on the bottom. And on the wine here, I have a layer of the yeast and some other items that were added to the wine at that time. So that's what that buildup is, and that's what the buildup is on the side of the glass there, that's yeast. It's been busy around here, okay? So let's take a close look at the tools. To siphon with, we need a siphoning tube, okay? And we use what's called a racking cane. Now, a racking cane is called a racking cane because it is specific to the purpose, instead of just calling it a siphoning tube. Racking canes are designed not to pull this sediment off of the bottom of the carboy. It's designed to leave it there and to pull liquid down before pulling it up. I know that sounds kind of strange. It's in the configuration of how they build the end. So let me have you come up close. I'm gonna show you the end of the racking cane, the tip that goes on it, and how the system works. Okay, so the racking cane here, this, the whole thing, you notice it's curved on one end here, and the tip is just a plain open tube tip. This is the magic bullet right here. This is a little cap that fits over it. The cap has these little, um, tabs on the inside of it, the tabs grab a hold of this so the cap holds itself in place. All right, now when I put my racking cane, let me get this on here the right way, there we go, my rack, racking cane tip is on there, so it's going to stay in place, it's not going to easily get bumped off. But if you'll notice it is now open on the top, so the liquid gets pulled down into this cap and then pulled up through the tube. This prevents me from pulling any sediment off the bottom of the tank. Very cleverly built, very good design. So that is what we've got going for us there, this wonderful little racking cane. Um, and that's what does the trick. When you're buying a kit, if you're looking at these products, 
They make this in plastic with a plastic tip or in this stainless steel with a stainless steel tip. I highly recommend the stainless. Eventually the plastic will crack and you're going to be off buying another one anyway. So you might as well make the investment if you plan to do this. It doesn't cost much more to get the metal one. The way this works. I have my racking cane. I want to transfer liquid from here to here. All right, this is my uh, secondary fermenter. Very similar to the first, it's just a little smaller in size. Size really doesn't matter, but I do like to reduce the size on the secondary if I can, and that way it gives it less air space on top. Now, in this, there's no air at all. It's pushed it all out. It's all carbon dioxide up in here. So, I'm not worried about that. We generally try to avoid getting too much air near the item that we're fermenting so that it doesn't oxidize. That'll cause some changes in flavors uh, and sometimes color too. We don't want that. Now, simple enough. I need to siphon. I don't want to have to sit there and suck on this thing in order to get what is in there down to here. So what I'll do is I'll start by filling this with water. Once it's completely filled with water, I'll hold both tips up together like this. That way it holds it. And then I'll slide my racking cane into this while holding this closed. As I do that, then I'll put this tip into the lower bottle. I'll use a little clip to hold it still. And at that point, we're going to be racking. Now I do need to mention the water that's gonna be in here. I have a pitcher right here. I am going to put the water into the pitcher and then transfer my cider to this other. Let's do that. Alrighty, have both of these full. Now it does need to be said that when you're doing this, keep towels around, okay? Keep something to soak up those spills because they're gonna happen. Now, I'm gonna get the fermenter, fermentation lock out of this one. I'm gonna set him aside. And I'm gonna pull the one out of this one and set him aside. Now, I'll plug the end of this tube my racking cane. Once it's in the bottom, wherever it lands, do not move it. Here we go. Okay. So I have cider flowing. In the event that you're doing this, sometimes these tubes will get bumped, knocked out of place, they make nice little tools that'll help you. This one is designed to simply hold that in place. Now I have the tube curving over sideways and the liquid is cascading off of the side of the glass and rolling downward into the bottom. This keeps it from generating too much air in the liquid. Okay, there we have it. We are transferring our liquid down into the lower carboy here. See if we can see that liquid cascading off of the side there and just rolling down onto the back of the liquid on the bottom down there. And so that's how that whole setup works. And that will very quickly, cleanly, and neatly drain that upper carboy. And as you can see, the liquid is already pulling down nice and quickly. This doesn't take long, all right? All right, this is almost finished. Now, well, something I wanna say, the yeast on the bottom of these tanks, believe it or not, that can be harvested. One of the most expensive things that we buy for home brewing is the yeast, which runs usually anywhere from about five to $12 per package or per fermentation. Now, of course, if you start reusing it, you get five or six different batches out of the one thing of yeast, then suddenly cost goes down. So what we'll do is the rest of this that's down here that didn't siphon out, I'm gonna take that and I'll swirl it a little bit and pour it in through a funnel into a small um, beer bottle. And I'll top it with one of these that has a smaller cork on it. It's designed just for that. I can put it in my fridge. 
save that, that's your yeast. You can throw it in the next batch and start it up that way. All right, now this is done racking. I have a little bit of liquid left over here, not enough for me to lose any sleep over or cry over, and I won't, but I need to get my firm lock on this. Well, there it is, racked into a new bottle. It's already bubbling up here, which means it's still fermenting. In another week, I'm gonna see another little layer on the bottom of this tank. That's because the fermentation is not done. This right here is partially finished cider. Now it's good and clear. This is where you get to taste it for the first time. Mm. I just took it out of what was left in the tube. Oh, that is good. Good, clean tasting. Appley. There is no flavor of yeast there. There's a slight aroma of yeast, but not much. So, and that's one of the reasons I like using this particular yeast. The Nottingham yeast works, even though it's a ale yeast, it works spectacularly well when it comes to making a good cider. I can't wait to get this one done. Oh, that's good. There's still a little sweetness in that, and that'll be a little drier when it is finished up. And then of course, once we add some fizz to it by carbonating it. Oh boy, that's gonna be good. So I'm gonna show you how to do that later on. That's called priming before bottling. And that's what we do to create the condition that allows a carbonated beverage to occur. It's really cool. Um, anyway, there they are. Beautiful, up and running. 10 days in on our fermentation here and the same way on this one. So if you want to learn about the wine, watch that video also. It's a little bit different. There's a few other processes involved in making wine and it takes slightly longer, but it's really a cool thing. Well, anyway, we get on with it. Uh, it'll be a matter of seconds for you and days for me. Well, for me, it's been several days. It's actually the 29th. Now I started doing this on the 5th. I racked it on the 15th. So really it took me too long to get around to racking it and it took me too long to get around to bottling it. And that's what I'm doing today. Um, I've had some other things going on, but that's okay. The neat lesson here is hey, if you miss it by a day or two or a week, it doesn't hurt a thing. All right, that's gonna be sitting in the bottle carbonating for a couple of weeks anyway. All right, so it didn't hurt it to sit in the fermenter a little while longer. The yeast has done what it's done. All it'll do is just make a slightly drier um, cider, nothing more than that. But for the most part, the fermentation is done because what sugar there was there has been taken care of. That cider is now hard cider. So here's the thing. I've got a dis what we call a dispensing bucket here, and it's just a big you know, six gallon bucket that has a valve on the bottom that is used for dispensing liquids. Okay, very simple. Um, here I have what is called dextrose. Dextrose is corn sugar. Mm. And the thing about dextrose has a very unique flavor. If you taste it, you'll immediately recognize it as that very commercial tasting sugar because it's used in so many commercial products. And once you taste it, you're like, oh, so that's where that flavor comes from. You'll immediately recognize that. So it's kind of neat, dextrose. Uh, and uh, I must say though, this is where the lesson comes in. Dextrose is not interchangeable with other types of corn sugar. For instance, corn syrup, you can't use it in place of this. You can't use high, fruct high fructose corn uh, syrup. In, in place of this. You need to use dextrose, okay? And there's a few reasons. Dextrose number one is a very, very fermentable sugar, okay? So yeast love it. It uh, ferments completely. Also, it's very clean tasting once it is fermented. Sometimes when brewing, we will make a neutral fermentation and that's where I just brew up uh, a bunch of sugar that's been mixed into water and boiled and then uh, I, I ferment that and I get a neutral fermentation that I can then flavor like anything I want it flavored like. For instance, I can make my own um, liqueurs 
that aren't distilled, but rather just fermented by using a high gravity yeast, making it a very high alcohol content and using something like this, just plain dextrose. And then we add the flavors on the backside. Uh, I'll get into that some other show, but what's important here is it must be corn sugar dextrose. It must also be no more than three quarters of a cup. This is so very important because the part of the lesson I'm teaching you today involves some things that could go bad. Uh, we could say, um, and let me explain the three quarters of a cup of corn sugar for priming five gallons of fluid is always kept as an absolute. And I learned this lesson the hard way. I once tried priming a batch of beer with two cups of sugar instead of one and three quarters of a cup. Uh, excuse me, not one and three quarters, but in, I used one cup of sugar rather than three quarters of a cup. Um, please forgive me. It's exactly three quarters of a cup and no more than three quarters of a cup. So anyway, when I primed once using one cup of sugar, I had bottles exploding. And then I had to very carefully and fearfully open the rest of the bottles, hoping they wouldn't explode in my hands while I'm trying to uncap them because they can send shards of glass into your hand if that happens. So it was a, a a sketchy and frightening situation that I had put myself into. Uh, so I'm going to forewarn you, do not over prime. You see the beer I had to pour out because it wasn't fully carbonated and so it wasn't ready and the bottles were already exploding and it was bad. So um, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's rule number one. Rule number two, the bottles I'll show you in a moment. Uh, we always want to leave an airspace at the top and we use uh, an airspace that's one inch to one and a half inches, no more and no less. If you have a bigger airspace, too much pressure can build up. And once again, you have an exploding bottle too little airspace at the top and you end up with a beer or a cider in this case that will not carbonate. All right, so there has to be the correct space uh, above the liquid between it and the cap on the bottle. Okay, I'll show you that in just a moment. We're going to take this sugar, we're going to boil some water, and I'm going to dissolve the sugar into the water. And then we will prime the cider. Now, the first thing I got to do is rack my cider into this bucket. And you've already seen that. I've already shown you the siphoning procedure, so I won't show you the, the same thing again. But I'm going to do that real quick, and then uh, I'm going to boil this. And once that's done, we're going to get on with bottling. I'll show you how this is done. Alrighty. Now I have finished transferring my cider. I'm going to start melt, melting in and dissolving in the uh, sugar here. And don't worry, this dissolves really fast. Okay, fine, um, fine ground dextrose like this, this commercial dextrose, will dissolve so super quick. You see there, it's already dissolved. All I want to do is just bring it up in temperature. I want it to boil one time, and after that, I'm satisfied. I've got a good sanitary product here. And that's the reason I do it this way, instead of just mixing it in cold water or mixing it directly into the cider, I'm simply sanitizing my ingredients. Okay, this is where we prime our liquid, and that's putting that sugar right down into what we made. Now, this is that beautiful cider. Oh, it is fantastic. So what I wanna do is get this stirring, not real fast, but somewhat quick. And then very gently, there's no rush here. And something I do is I use my stirring paddle to lift liquid off of the bottom. Okay, because again, this is going straight to the bottom when it hits that liquid. And I know that because I've just done it that many times and I've learned what uneven primed batches are, why they occur. It's quite, quite remarkable if you don't stir it just right. Get an uneven prime. So some bottles a little more fizzy than others. That's never fun. Okay. Hey. 
Now, I'm not trying to get air in it, unfortunately. I am getting a little. That's not going to ruin anything or hurt anything because here's the thing. The yeast actually needs a little bit of oxygen in order to process that sugar properly. And the little bit of stirring that it gets in this priming process helps to infuse it with that oxygen it needs. That will uh, rise to the top of the bottle and will become part of the air slug at the top of the bottle. The carbon dioxide will sit right underneath it and it will push down into the beer. Really cool, huh? But as a general rule, yeah, at this point, we try not to get any excess of air. And again, I'm going to the bottom of the bucket, and as I pull across, I lift. So it's pulling up into the liquid, whatever is on bottom. All right, now I'm getting ready to do my bottling. I've got it all primed. It's ready to go. And I'm looking forward to this. It's something I want to do. Want to keep anything out of it so always keep it covered all right it doesn't have to be tight the same thing i do back here on my bottles i keep paper on top of them if i have sanitized bottles the way i know if they're sanitized is there's a cover of paper over them and that's sort of my little note to myself that hey i've already done the sanitizing on these Plus, it keeps anything from drifting down in the bottles. I don't want any uh, yeasts or stray organisms getting in there and messing up my beverage. So once I sanitize these, I keep them clean with paper. <clears throat> now remember, we're using the word sanitize, not sterilize. We're not looking for a sterile environment. We don't need it. We've got something here that's chock full of alcohol, okay? We just need a sanitary environment and it'll maintain itself if we start it there. So what I have here is a dispensing bucket and I'm about to dispense right into this. And I'm gonna fill this until I have about an inch and a half space on the top. Okay, there we go. And that is roughly from here to here about an inch and a quarter and so that's absolutely perfect but such a clear beautiful liquid that i have in this i mean that's incredible i'm looking forward to this when it's finished it's carbonating there will be a very thin light layer of white on the bottom and that'll just be the yeast that built up during the uh, carbonating process now what i normally do when i'm bottling is i will fill nor uh multiple bottles and I'll do them usually about a case at a time. There we go. And when I do my bottles, I then, you know, after I get a, a case filled, I then start capping them. Now, I'm not going to fill a full case before I show you how to cap. But that's just kind of how I do it. You do yours your way. There we go. So I have, this one's about an inch. I have one that's about an inch and a half, one that's about an inch and a quarter, and they are all correct, okay? As long as they're in that zone. Uh, if you've got too much, it's not a problem. Just pour a little of it into the next bottle. And if you don't have enough, well, you know how to put more in there, okay? Not hard. I'll tell you what, let's take a quick look at how we do the capping, and then you're gonna understand how to make your cider. Now, another pro tip I wanna mention to you always keep lots of towels around. There's one at my feet. Um, and uh, you know, it was like when I was doing my uh, dispensing into the bucket here, I lost a little bit of liquid because I left the valve open. Well, that wasn't a problem because the towel was there to catch it. All right, that, little mistakes like that happen. Don't lose any sleep. Now, when capping your bottles, I use a little a hand capper. It's this item right here. And right in here is a magnet that'll hold your cap. And the whole thing that this does is it just shoves that cap down onto the top of the bottle and pushes the crimps in around the... Uh, you have a little flange right at the top of the bottle, that wide spot. And there's a lower flange. The lower flange is used to hold the capper as it shoves the cap down onto the upper flange. Okay? And let's do that real quick. Put this on here. And there we go. This is capped. It is primed. 
All I need to do is wait for it to carbonate and I'm gonna have a magnificent cider. Yeah, let's do that again. Now this doesn't take a lot of strength, but it does take a firm push, okay? That's all there is to it, folks. Well, we are at the end of the cycle. The cider is beginning to build fizz. Now, it's not completely fizzy yet, but I'm impatient. Anyway, we've got a little bit of a fizz there. Not a loud one, but we got one. And we have a beautiful, clear, clean, crisp, exciting cider. Look at that. Oh man, that is really nice looking. Got the bubbles fizzing up in there. Mm. Flat delicious. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm gonna be enjoying this. You know, the neat thing is this is so simple to make. It's two ingredients, and they're both very natural. Okay, we've made a beautiful, delicious hard cider that's sparkling. And it wasn't just a whole lot of work, right? It's mostly just being patient. You know, some of us have a hard time with that at times. But you know what? As each day passes, the fizz grows a little bit better and a little deeper. Mm. And I've learned something. There are a lot of products that are fermented that once they sit in the bottle and just rest for some period of time, whether it be weeks or months, they actually improve. Pale ales, um, brown ales especially, dark beers, they really bottle condition well. So you leave them for months to just sit there ignore them and then when they're ready you get to enjoy so that's the way that works simple enough please enjoy your cider do me a favor and take a look at the links right down below in the description box there's a link there to my recipes at uh, satrotter.com and there is a link there for wild grains which is a bread subscription product if you Click on that link and you order that wild grain subscription, you're gonna be getting sourdough and uh, pastries and pasta sent to you on your schedule. And you get a choice of what all goes in the box. Okay, and that's what I like about it is once you're in the program, you can go through and substitute one bread for another or one item for another and kind of customize your box to suit your needs. So it's really, really cool. Check that out. Also, check out the link for Chef's Temp. That's a chef's thermometer. Every kitchen needs a chef's thermometer. That's a good quality chef's thermometer that has a lot of great features. A rotating uh, display so that no matter which direction you point it, it's always face up. It lights. It is rechargeable so you don't have to replace batteries in it. That's really cool. So take a look at that little guy. It's a reasonably priced chef's thermometer. And as I said again, every kitchen, every kitchen, needs that thermometer check it out oh thanks for watching click subscribe don't forget to click the bell click the thumbs up that really helps me out more than you can imagine also if you would share this video with other people and please enjoy your cider that's what it's about <laughs> mm.